My name is Sam Bakning, and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. In the film Inception, Don Cobb is an extractor. He steals confidential information by hacking into a subject's brain during a dream, and by conning the victim into disclosing his or her secrets. This intellectually challenging and visually captivating film makes a series of assumptions, none of which withstand close scrutiny. The first one is about dream sharing. The film's fundamental premise is that dreams are objective entities, akin to buildings, whose existence is independent of the observer. They are therefore accessible to all and sundry. But dreams are not objective entities, they are highly subjective experiences. External and internal cues are interpreted by and integrated into complex, shape-shifting and highly idiosyncratic neural networks resident in the head of the dreaming individual. One cannot tap into another person's subjectivity, thoughts, dreams, emotions, not even in principle, and this is the infamous problem known in philosophy as intersubjectivity. While we can communicate and discuss our inner world, we cannot share it in any meaningful sense. We cannot invite visitors or tourists there into our inner world. Lucid and directed dreaming is possible, but dream sharing is not. If we were to enter someone else's mind, we would merely experience our reactions to her mind and not the mind itself. Intersubjectivity is defined thus by the Oxford Companion to Philosophy. Intersubjectivity refers to the status of being somehow accessible to at least two, usually all in principle, minds or subjectivities. It thus implies that there is some sort of communication between those minds, which in turn implies that each communicating mind is aware not only of the existence of the other, but also of its intention to convey information to the other. The idea for theorists is that if subjective processes can be brought into agreement, then perhaps that is as good as the unattainable status of being objective, completely independent of subjectivity. The question facing such theories is whether intersubjectivity is definable without presupposing an objective environment in which communication takes place, the wiring from subject A to subject B. At a less fundamental level, the need for intersubjective verification of scientific hypotheses has been long recognized. So the problems are formidable. The second assumption made by the film is that of defenses and dreams. The film cannot make up its mind. Cobb tells the aptly named Ariadne, the architect, the dream designer, that the dreaming person's defenses are down and all vigilance is gone. This vulnerability makes possible the art of extraction and renders counter-extraction, also known as neurosecurity, defensive tactics against thieving extractors, makes it a necessity. Yet, through the movie, the invaded subject's subconscious, should be, by the way, unconscious, keeps attacking the extraction team. It keeps sending out hostile, violent, and murderous projections, figments, to eliminate the invading extractors. Cobb even compares these apparitions to white blood cells. So, which is it in a dream state? Are the defenses down, or are the defenses at, a, in, at an immunological maximum? It's not made clear. As Freud, the Surrealist, and uh, the Dadaist knew, dreams are audiovisual manifestations of the unconscious, the seat of all psychological defense mechanisms. In dreams, we are actually hypervigilant and paranoid. One cannot compel a subject to reveal secrets, even under hypnosis, let alone while dreaming. Moreover, dreams provide access only to the unconscious, but secrets reside exclusively in the conscious part of the mind. The extractors are looking for confidential information in the wrong place. Finally, dreams use symbols and representations and require interpretation. Even the most pedestrian information is thoroughly encrypted using a highly pri private and usually visual language. The film errs 
in that it depicts dreams as merely augmented reality, albeit of a highly imaginative and creative sort. Dreams are not augmented reality, they are coded messages. They are not representations of the world. In this sense, every dreaming person is a solipsist and an extraterrestrial alien with a completely private and usually completely inaccessible language. Now, then there's the question of waking up and the stability of dreams. In the film, there are only two or three methods of terminating the dream state and waking up. In reality, the repertory is unlimited. We wake up for hundreds of reasons, including metabolic processes, pain, environmental stimuli, anxiety, compulsive thoughts, circadian awareness, habits, fears, thoughts, and so on. Dreams are highly unstable states. They are so unstable, in effect, that many scholars believe that this precisely is their role to keep us alert and on our toes, even as we sleep. The use of sedatives, as in the film, suppresses dreaming, making them highly counterproductive as far as the extractors are concerned. There is the issue of dream time dilation. This is a long discarded myth. Dream time is roughly equal to real time. One hour in dream in a dream translates to one real hour. It is true, though, that the laws of physics are sometimes suspended while dreaming. Distances contract or vanish, for instance, and other things happen which would not normally happen in reality. And this gives the erroneous impression of time dilation. Totems and the reality test. The film warns against the blurring of boundaries and distinctions between dream and reality, especially if one leverages one's memories in the framework of lucid dreaming and incorporates them in the design of new phantasmagorias. Dreamers may lose the reality test. They may remain unable to tell the two states apart. To guard against this ominous psychosis, extractors use totems, objects whose behavior is different in a dream to their true and everyday conduct. Cobb carries a spinning top, which in his dreams never stops spinning, an oddity which informs him of his slumberous state. While it is true that objects acquire unfamiliar and even outlandish properties and behaviors in our dreams, their deviations and abnormal characteristics vary from one dream state to another, and they are utterly unpredictable. In one dream, the spinning top will spin forever. In another, it will refuse to spin at all. And in a third, it will turn into a dove. Totems, therefore, would be useless as a litmus test. Far better to use a classic reality check to try to go through a solid object, to levitate, to look at the face of an analog clock, or flick a, li flick a light switch on and see what happens. Moreover, it is not strictly true that all dreams feel real to us. Some dreams do, and some dreams don't. We often know that we are dreaming, even when we are in the throes of an unfolding visual narrative and uh, that is inexorable. We sometimes test ourselves in the dream, or even will ourselves to wake up. This ability to tell dream from reality is at the heart of our certainty of which is which. Nor is it universally true that dreams have no discernible remembered beginning and that we just find ourselves inexplicably immersed in them. The professional literature contains numerous descriptions of dreams with neat beginnings and endings. They are narratives. More often dreams lack an, lack an ending than beginning. These absent resolutions and closures provoke and elicit in us psychodynamic processes which are conducive to personal transformation and growth, or even to healing. Can dreams be nested? Can a dreamer dream that he is dreaming, and so on? False awakening, a dream within a dream, has been documented. It is rare, but it is an existent phenomenon. The dreamer usually dreams that he is waking up. There are three caveats, though. One, most nested dreams occur in familiar surroundings, one's bed, home, or workplace. Two, the nested dreams share subject matter, some continuity in a narrative, a plot, a storyline. And three, invariably the dreamer realizes that he is dreaming. Only the second condition is met to a limited extent in the film. Then there is the issue of creation versus discovery or inspiration. Everyone around Cobb insists that inception 
implanting an idea in someone's dreaming mind so that he feels that he has come up with it once he wakes up. They all insist that this is an impossibility. Dreaming, Arthur says, involves pure creation. It is a process that feels like discovery or inspiration, rather than the laborious and tedious constructs that we come up with while we are awake. Cobb tells Ariadne that our brain is far more active and more efficiently deployed when we dream. Completely untrue, by the way, judging by brainwave activity. According to these cinematic extractors, implanted ideas would, therefore, feel alien, absent the essential experiences of discovery and inspiration. The subject is bound to react with violence and aggression to the dimly perceived invasion and mind or dream snatching. It is the extractor team's job to avoid these defenses against intrusion by convincing the subject that the foreign idea is actually his. Saying more would constitute a cruel spoiler, so I will, I will, I will stop here. But can we really make the distinction between our ideas and ideas that we have been exposed to and absorbed, ideas whose source is external? Is this taxonomy of endogenous versus exogenous ideas correct? The answer is a resounding no. We cannot reliably attribute our ideas to their various sources, and we cannot credibly tell their origins apart. Nor do we try to. We assimilate memes and make them ours because such plagiarism has survival value. The unhindered dissemination of strange notions, to borrow Saito's phrase in the phone, has untold beneficial effects, as in any internet addict will attest. Furthermore, inspiration and intuition are often cloaked as reasoning and ratiocination. We feel that certain discoveries, theories and works of art are the outcomes of our toil and rational investment, even when they are actually the tip of an unconscious iceberg. Dreams are no different. When we are in them, we obey this or that logic, construct theories about our environment and events and actors, and we assume ownership of our ideas and actions regardless of their source. We never bother to stop and, and ask the absurd and unanswerable question. Wait a minute, whose idea was it in the first place? We annex and assimilate everything around, around us. It all becomes ours. And so the premise on which the entire film is built is dubious, not to say fallacious.